Um, okay. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Sorry if I sound like I'm sick, it's mostly because I am. Um, today, I have the pleasure of introducing Manuel, a good friend of mine. And, uh, he is a physicist. <sighs> Sorry. Uh, hoping to finish up his PhD dissertation um, with a, a, hopefully some side of machine learning that we'll learn about today. His advisor is Dr. Jose Castillo. Um, and the topic today is uh, coastal ocean modeling, and I can't wait to hear all about it. So go ahead and take it away, Manuel. Thank you, Abe. That's great. Uh, today we're going to talk about not... Uh, wait. Where's my screen? Can you see, can you see my screen? Uh, it's currently just black on my screen. Okay, let me check here. Is that better? Yep, there we go. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, the machine learning is going to be for the next opportunity. We're going to talk today about computational fluid dynamics. Uh, this is one of the two components of my dissertation defense. And and what we're doing is we are uh, redeveloping the general curvilinear coastal ocean model. I'm going to go into detail, uh, but with a new mimetic uh, operator framework. So we're going to take advantage of uh, the recent developments in mimetic operators that are now capable of handling 3D curvilinear uh, geometries. And we are uh, recreating the GCCOM as a prototype right now in MATLAB using those tools. And we're gonna see why uh, we need to do that and what's the uh, motivation for it. So first, uh, the realm that we're gonna work with is coastal ocean dynamics. Coastal ocean dynamics is extremely complicated, a complex field of study because it handles uh, multi-scales uh, from kilometers to sub-meters, uh, multi-physics systems, something that has to do with thermodynamics, but also uh, Navier Stokes equation, computational, computational fluid dynamics, uh, and many times also biogeochemical modeling and different phenomena that are going to uh, go uh, interact between them in this realm of uh, uh, temporal scale. We have uh, time here and a spatial scale, right? And different, different kind of physics inside here, right? So maybe larval dispersion, internal waves, that's something we're gonna go into detail today. Uh, turbulent mixing, something that we need to resolve too very well. And the GCCOM is going to be handling all of these. Eventually right now we handle a subset of these uh, phenomena, but it's definitely uh, extremely complex. complex. So we will focus today in uh, internal waves, which is a kind of stratified phenomena. So as we know, the ocean is stratified naturally because of the difference of uh, temperature and density is stratifying layers. So that gives rise to uh, a specific phenomena uh, that it's uh, entwined to that stratification. One of them is the internal waves. So internal waves are basically uh, the same as surface waves, but happening in the uh, interface of the different layers of the stratification. And when you have continuous stratification as is the, in the ocean, then uh, you will have uh, internal waves moving all around the water column, right? So internal waves are going to be transport and mixing inside that seawater column. Yes, so they will happen everywhere in the, in the ocean and they are basically non-dispersive in the open ocean, right? So uh, when they interact with something, uh, 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 isolated feature in the middle of the ocean, like a seamount or something, they will just refract and refract and they will conserve the energy in a soliton state. But uh, the interesting thing happens when we go into the uh, coastal ocean, the, the one that we're interested in, in this model. And uh, when the, the internal waves go into the coastal ocean, what happens is that uh, the energy starts breaking up, right? So the tur there's a turbulence uh, that starts to rise and the energy breaks down from the ocean current, uh, 
scales, which are kilometers, into meters and submeter scales, right? We are seeing something like that happening here. And it's something that in, more or less depends on uh, the slope of the coast where it's actually interacting. But at the end, uh, always happens that there's a turbulent bore that it will uh, move the energy that comes from the ocean currents into the small, small scales. And this is one of the main processes that will actually feed the energy into the plankton and the phytoplankton. So it starts the whole food chain. It, it has a, um, a big, big impact in the ecology of all across the world, right? So uh, this also happens because uh, the deep water that it's on the, on the bottom of the ocean is going to rise with these internal waves and they are richer in uh, nutrients and they are going to feed nutrients into the warmer waters, right? So uh, that in addition to the actual turbulent uh, stuff that is happening there, right? Okay, so as I said, they are linear in the open ocean and become highly nonlinear in the coastal ocean. So we need to resolve all of that in our model. This is a little schematic uh, of how they travel. They form basically wave guides in the open ocean and they, uh, these are the, the crest uh, and truths of each of these internal waves. Uh, basically moving around in every direction in the ocean and uh, interacting at the end with some part of, uh, of a coastal uh, segment, right? Uh, but uh, anywhere in the open ocean, they're going to conserve energy and they're going to be moving uh, this energy across the stratified ocean, right? Uh, and then the interesting thing happens when we go into the coast. So, but this this is just to uh, communicate the fact that these internal waves are ubiquitous, they happen everywhere in the ocean, and they are actually a, a defining feature of the stratified uh, um, body of water, any, any that, that would be, right? And when they actually um, come into the, into the coastal region, then they most likely are going to interact with some special feature in, in this region. And one of the most inter interesting of them is the submarine canyons, right? So submarine canyons uh, happen uh, in many places in the, in the near shore. And uh, this one is on Monterey Bay. There's uh, one of the biggest submarine canyons there uh, in the West Coast. That's the biggest on the West Coast. Uh, and this is the La Jolla Canyon right here uh, in San Diego. The, there's also a very steep submarine canyon happening there. And these internal waves, when they come here because of the steepness of the slope of, of the walls of this canyon, then they are going to uh, refract in very specific ways. And in these specific regimes, then we actually can uh, measure and detect the signal of these internal waves going back and forth in this specific regime, right? Uh, because of the highly nonlinearity of, of their nature uh, in most places where there's just a gentle slope the signal of the internal waves are going to get lost in, in everything that is happening there in addition of just the internal wave coming in. So in these specific regimes is where we actually can capture some of this information and model it and uh, understand better the role of internal waves in, in coastal ocean waters, right? So something that happens here, as we can see the geometry here in these in this submarine canyons are going to be very, very rough, uh, very extreme geometries, uh, basically vertical walls. And we need some special tools to handle those geometries in, in computational fluid dynamics. Uh, so that's why we actually need uh, general geometries or 3D curvilinear geometries, also called boundary fitted coordinates, right? So there are several ways to make a grid basically and handle these kind of geometries. Uh, one of the most popular historically is the sigma grid. They are boundary fitted to the bottom. Uh, and then each one of the uh, horizontal levels are going to follow roughly the shape of the bottom. And at the, at the top, they are going to end up being flat basically, 
right? That's the sigma grid. The C grid is just a rectilinear grid that is, uh, it doesn't have any special shape with the bottom and this. Uh, so that introduces some errors because these uh, cells that are close to the bathymetry here, to the, to the bottom of the, of the ocean, they don't handle the full information of the cell. So you have to actually shave for them and, and account for them while here we have full cells on, on there, right? But something that would be actually better than this is, is a curvilinear system in which you not only have a, a boundary fitted coordinates in, with the bottom, but you also have it with uh, the sides, right? So here we don't have anything on the side, but we can see that these are not straight uh, up uh, in the sigma. That's one of the main characteristics. The uh, vertical coordinate is aligned. That's what it's uh, the terminology that is an aligned vertical coordinate. And in curvilinear, we have non-aligned vertical coordinate. So in general, when this is 3D, we will have a curvilinear or curve in the three main directions, right? It is, in general, it's going to be conforming uh, to the boundary in the three directions. So if we had, uh, in this sigma example, if we had a vertical wall here and we wanted to model that, that wouldn't um, conform to the to the boundary. It wouldn't be boundary fitted on the sides. It's only boundary fitted on the bottom, right? So as I said, historically, sigma is the, has been the um, coordinate of choice in oceanography. It works very well in the open ocean, but while we go through the uh, coastal region, then we have to be much more careful because of something called the uh, non-hydrostatic inconsistency. And that basically is a limit to the steepness uh, that the sigma grid can actually handle before uh, introducing corrections. Uh, we need uh, to introduce some specific corrections there. Uh, so that's one, uh, another very important uh, argument on why we need curvilinear coordinates in these regimes. This is an example of a curvilinear grid. This is for a seamount, just a basic uh, Gaussian uh, seamount on the bottom. This is from a previous paper that I produced. And this is a little bit of the hydrostatic consistency. All I will say is that at some point when these um, horizontal, uh, well, the, these are uh, these horizontal lines here are going to move according with uh, the bottom bathymetry, right? And where we are in something like this situation, uh, magnified here, then you start seeing that. Uh, those horizontals and the verticals are uh, become become more and more parallel, right? So that uh, actually creates an artifact that needs to be corrected for, and that is what gives rise to the hydrostatic inconsistency. And one way to solve for this is just uh, instead of uh, doing any correction, then you can actually do a better grid and use curvilinear um, coordinates here and something that is not a straight up, but something that is maybe orthogonal. And that way you can actually uh, not have that problem where these uh, two coordinates become basically parallel to each other, right? Great, so now let's introduce the GCCOM. The GCCOM is the General Curvilinear Coastal Ocean Model is a um, coastal oceanographic model, a CFD model that we have been developing here in the CSRC for a long time, since uh, the 2006 was the first prototype of it, right? It basically handles the, the Navier-Stokes equation like this, in this specific formulation, with the addition of temperature and salinity and an equation of state to, uh, to uh, transition between them, right? Uh, so, you solve for velocity, you correct the velocity. So you use a, a prediction correction method, you cor correct for that velocity. From there, you find the uh, coupling of the velocity with the temperature and the salinity. And from there, you update the equation of state. And that equation of state is going to give you the next stage of the buoyancy. The buoyancy is the main driving force here, the body force. And it's basically what is going to handle the whole uh, dynamics of the of the problem. So that's 
more or less the loop, you solve for velocity, correct it with the Businesca approximation and the continuity equation. Uh, then you solve for TNS, then you update the equation of state and that uh, updates the buoyancy and the buoyancy starts the process over again, right? Great. So this model is uh, non-hydrostatic. It uses the full Navier-Stokes equation. It's capable of handling 3D curvilinear uh, geometries. It's validated for stratified fluids uh, using sigma grids so far. So that's one of the main reasons why we want to move this to mimetic and using everything uh, curvilinear and test everything, test everything in curvilinear grids. Uh, I personally parallelize this for PETA and exascale computation using PETSI. Uh, there's a paper about it, but well, we're not going to go into detail on that. But this is a little bit of the history of the GCCOM so far, right? So as I was saying, we use the Bosinex approximation, we use predictor corrector method for the velocity. The Laplacian is completely implicit uh, yeah, in, in the sense that it's um, a matricial uh, um, product, a matrix vector product that we solve at once. And it's, it's formulated like this in a 3D curvilinear manner. The advection is very specific. We need a forward backward advection scheme that um, it's formulated by Kawamura in 1986. And this, this is the uh, specific uh, formulation of it, right? So these are the contravariant uh, components of the velocity. And these are the velocity fields in each one of the uh, computational directions, right? So this is in, this is in general curvilinear coordinates. Uh, the model so far uses a runge kuta tree and the turbulence is handled with large eddy simulations using the Smagorinsky model, something that I don't go into detail right now, but basically this is one of the most complete uh, and used and popular turbulence model used uh, in, in this kind of computational fluid dynamics problems. Uh, and it resolves very well uh, the energy scales up to very small scales with uh, relatively ease or relatively low uh, computational resources, right? Great, so we need some experiments to show and to validate for. Uh, today, we're gonna show two experiments. One is the CMON. The CMON is just a qualitative example that we use just to show that uh, it looks correct. So these are the results from uh, Mohamed Abouli in 2016. And these are different slides of a simon that is being forced from the left side uh, with a linearly increasing velocity from 0 to 0 0.1 on the top. And basically, it's, it's blowing over uh, the simon. And what we need to do here, what we need to see here is, is an undulating pattern and the drag force uh, being clearly lower on the on the back side of the seam on re, there, right? So that's all we can see from there. And it's just more to check that everything is working correctly. But it's a, it's a pretty example and it, it, it looks fine. We're gonna see a, a movie about it at the end, right? And the log exchange is the other example that we're gonna see today. And this one is, uh, it has two components, one qualitative, that has to do with these Kevin health uh, instabilities that uh, are going to develop in the middle of the interface. So basically this problem starts in a tank, is a tank with two different uh, uh, density fluids. One has a fly higher fluid than the other. And the idea is that they, uh, there's a gate on the, on the center that is removed at time zero. And when that happens, uh, the densities are going to move, the lighter fluid is going to go over, the uh, heavier fluid is going to go under, and they are going to move in different, in opposite direction, right? But what's going to happen in the middle is the creation of these kevin helms instabilities. And these are uh, everywhere in nature too. They happen every time there is a, a horizontal difference of density and basically they show that the uh, vertical and horizontal velocities are of the same magnitude and they start basically swirling around and create creating these bores, right? 
And as you can see, they uh, are going to be created all are, are along the uh, interface between the two liquid, liquids. And that's the qualitative assessment of this problem, right? There's a second one that is an actual validation. It's quantitative and that uh, has to do with the fraud number. We're gonna see that a little bit later. So yeah, this is the Kevin Hellhoff's instabilities. These are field experiments actually with two different densities. And as you can see, these, um, these, are, these are three segments of the same uh, long, let's say long image, right? But this, it starts here. These are this, the first uh, stages. Then it starts cooling up and cools uh, as much as uh, when it just becomes turbulence at the end and it just mixes, right? And this is a little bit of a schematic of what is happening. The, the shear forces from the densities on the top and the bottom, the two uh, different velocities are going to become uh, similar and they are going to start swirling around, right? Uh, so that's how they are created. Yeah, so something that is very important is that these velos are only created in non-hydrostatic models. And it's just, uh, it's a feature of non-hydrostatic models that this uh, rise up. And that's one way of showing that our model is non-hydrostatic. And if from this paper, we can see that in the top, this, this is the mode where the, this model in a specific, this is a different model, this is not GCCOM, but this model has a mode that is non-hydrostatic. And in the top, we have the result of this log release uh, experiment, log exchange experiment with no, with hydrostatic assumption, right, on the top. And then when it's non-hydrostatic, we see what happens on the bottom. The Kevin Hellhoff stability is happening, right? Okay, so the validation here is done by tracking the speed of the wavefront on the top and the bottom and calculated, calculating the fraud number, which is a, basically a, a non-dimensional expression of the Wave from speed, and it's it's just the wave from speed divided by the specific speed that is the derivative of the buoyancy of the problem. Uh, well, of, of the buoyancy of the mean of the starting density density field, but uh, but yeah, just the front number is just the uh, the quotient of two different velocities. And for this specific problem with this specific uh, array, uh, yeah, array, uh, the theoretical one is. Uh, one over uh, square root of two, which is this number, 0. 0.7071. And the uh, GCCOM uh, found out a uh, front number of 0. 0.7176, which is uh, within 1% of the theoretical value, right? So that was validated there. They got really good results with it. But one problem that they had is that they needed to run this with a very, very small uh, time step and it amounted for these numbers, uh, five, or five ten, uh, times to the minus four, right? Which is very, very small. It's, uh, it's not practical and uh, for this problem, you can get some results, but when you want to scale this to actually field scale problems where you have uh, kilometers the, to resolve and you need uh, to run it for, 24 hours or 48 hours of actual simulation time, then this DT is not gonna cut it, right? And uh, this one, uh, this was another big uh, reason why we are moving everything to a different framework. And is uh, that one of the problems that we have, it takes around three months uh, of running uh, just to get some results and they are not the correct results. So it's not um, practical. Great. So now let's introduce the mimetic operators and why or how do we intend to do a GCCOM model hybrid, right? So, or a GCCOM based on the uh, mimetic operators. Right, okay, let me take one. So the mimetic operators is uh, basically this speciality of uh, Professor Castillo, which is my advisor. And these are um, matrix representations or, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, matrix representation of the basic physical operators or mathematical operators, gradient, divergence, laplacian, and curve, right? These four guys. 
uh, basically what you do is that you extract all the necessary information of the grid and then you uh, apply the, the uh, necessary matrix transformation to actually get the representation of this, the action of these operators in a quantity inside the grid. So there's a lot more to it, but this is basically what happens. So when you apply these operators to a specific quantity, then you get some very, uh, they, they basically uh, are going to comply with the same properties than the mathematical counterparts have, right? So uh, the gradient is going to behave like a gradient, the divergence is going to behave like a divergence, and so forth and so on, right? So they uh, greatly simplify the model development because then we don't have to think in terms of uh, finite difference or uh, finite volume or whatever, but we just uh, feed a specific vector to a matrix and then we get the result, right? Um, However, they are based in finite difference and they are based specifically in central finite difference. Uh, so that's going to be important later, but something we need to say right now. And besides the making everything more simple for development, it's also uh, more conservative all the way to the border, right? So this is specific formulation of the mimetic operators, which are the Castillo, Corvino Castillo mimetic operators are uh, very uh, conservative. So, so they are conservative all the way to the border of the grid, so to, to the last point of the grid. This is something that in finite difference is, is not obtainable uh, and you need a very specific formulation of the grid and of the operators to get this property, right? Uh, so that's also remarkable. Great. And in the last few months and the last year, the, there has been a development of uh, something called the MOL library, uh, which are uh, free to use or open source uh, library of metric operators and uh, associated tools to use with it. And they are based in the Corvino Castillo metric operators, right? And recently, very recently, this has been ported to 3D curvilinear. So now we finally are in the stage where we can actually use these operators to create a non hydrostatic 3D curvilinear coastal ocean model, and we intend of, to take advantage of that. Right. Okay, so I have talked about this, they are highly accurate. Uh, we can also choose any accuracy degree, so literally any number is going to be harder and harder to solve, but you can do it. Uh, 3D, they are you can use any geometry, everything becomes a matrix vector operation. So that also saving in, in resources instead of going through loops, uh, we just doing matrix vector. Uh, so the, opera the operations become just matrix vector in that sense. Uh, the simplicity is not well used here. This is not, it's, it's not the right. I was gonna say that you yes. should remove that because that's confusing. Yes, sorry. <laughs> So they are available online. Uh, they're free to use. You, anyone can use them. Uh, the team plans to use it for many other things besides this specific uh, application. But right now, this specific uh, application of the mimetic operators and the MOL library it represents the most, the most complex and ambitious application of mimetic operators to date, right? So, how do we tackle this? We started last year. Uh, we're using MATLAB as a prototype environment and Jared, which is here, is working on porting everything to C. So that's uh, good for you, man. <laughs> uh, but that's definitely necessary because here we're just basically uh, putting the groundwork together, demonstrating that it works. And then to make it scale, we cannot just use MATLAB. We have to use a uh, low level uh, environment and parallelize it there. Right, so one of the uh, additional improvement is that we are using a strong stability preserving runge kuta time integration scheme. And, and specifically this one with time stages and four order. This is from Ketcheson, uh, 
paper where he explains and, and introduces this specific uh, algorithm. And right now the stages where we are is we have 2D and 3D fully mimetic model. So we have a model that is 2D in, in addition of the 3D curvilinear model, we also have a 2D model and we have fully validated the log exchange in these two settings, right? Right now we're working on the 3D curvilinear cases and so far we have a 3D curvilinear Simon experiment that we're gonna show that is a, what is called good looking, right? So there's some uh, artifacts happening there and we know the implementation is not entirely correct yet, but uh, as, uh, as far as we, you, we will see, it actually works somewhat uh, well, right? So that's, uh, that's where, we, where we are right now. And we're gonna move forward with other validation experiments. I, I won't show them here, but uh, I want to show some of these results from log exchange and the CMOT. So this is something that I came up uh, with, uh, with help of Johnny, of course. And basically we realized that for the advection problem, we cannot use, we can not just simply use uh, central differences. Uh, for advection, we actually need an equivalent or some kind of uh, forward backward equivalent of the Kawamura uh, scheme that we had before. Uh, and what we came up with is something called mimetic upwind, right? So first we, uh, or I'm, I'm using a gradient based momentum equation and we have here the three components of the gradient. Uh, this is to solve this specific part of the equations, which is the advection of the momentum. And as we can see here, these three uh, components are all of them uh, they have subscript U because all of them live in the U space of the uh, staggered grid. And while these three components live in the V space and these three live in the W space, right? So here we actually need to be careful in translating everything to their own space and operating it on their own space. That's step one. So right from there, we cannot use uh, divergence as as we see here. So this is not just going to be a divergence. It needs uh, middle steps there. And the way I'm solving it right now is with the gradient in this, in this step, right? So we have to interpolate each one of the velocities to their uh, counterparts and then apply the gradient appropriately and operate this appropriately, right? But that by itself is not uh, enough either. As I was saying, uh, these gradients in the mimetic operator sense, uh, they are uh, central difference. So we cannot just use that. We have to come up with something that is equivalent to a upwind scheme. So this is, this is what it's called the compact form of the upwind uh, scheme uh, for two different uh, quantities. Uh, and this A is the coefficient of this uh, of this equation, right? So basically we're going to solve A uh, nabla U, right? So A plus is going to become the maximum of between A and zero and A minus the minimum of between A and zero. And then we define two different uh, approaches to the uh, derivative. One is a one-sided uh, forward uh, approach and one is a backward approach, right? And by doing this specific calculation, when one of these are always going to be zero, depending of uh, the direction of the information in that specific point, then we will always have the upwind information happening, right? On, on, the, on the integration of the equation, right? And this is just a Euler integration just for illustration purposes, but that's the basically the upwind and that's how uh, most people address the advection scheme. And that's also the principle of the Kawamura uh, forward backward advection scheme. So that's why I chose this and developed this uh, specific um, approach, right? So the missing piece that we need to introduce here is a new 
gradient operators in the mimetic sense that are either uh, one-sided on the left or on the right, right? So we're gonna call them forward and backward. And those were created in this specific sense. And now we have uh, uh, gradient operator for U, uh, for the U space in backward and forward, for the V space in backward and forward, and for the W space in, in backward and forward. And as, as we were looking at here, we now have this mathematic with this approach, and we have everything together in this mimetic Uwin that we have here on the, on the right-hand side. So definitely, if we didn't do this, the whole treatment, if we didn't do all of this, uh, the advection didn't work. There was no other way to make the advection resolve. It will always uh, degrade and the information will be lost especially here because we have information from the two sides in the in the lock release happening from the two sides right okay so let's see some results finally great and let's start with the log change in 2d so on the left we see the contours um, progressively for five seconds 10 seconds 30 and 50 seconds and as you can see there's definitely uh, the shape of the Kevin Helhoff's instability is happening there. So that's for sure happening. We see the non-hydrostatic events uh, developing. We see the bores developing there. So part one is done. So we know qualitatively this is working well. So quantitatively, we actually have to calculate that fraud number, right? So here we see the fraud number in the, in the full run. And something that is very specific of uh, log exchange is that, uh, and that's why it's good for validation, is that there is a transient at the start and then uh, the problems uh, converges to the final velocity of the wavefront speed. And that, that's the one that we use to validate the model, right? So there's a, we see the transient here this is this little blob, and then we see the model uh, going towards the theoretical value, which is the, um, so I have, I have another one, this is better. So this uh, dotted line is that theoretical value, and we see it uh, converging there, right? So if we take the whole run, we have a difference of 2.6%, but if we take just a, uh, uh, the non-transient, after the transient, we have a difference of 9.92% of the uh, theoretical value there. So that's already very good. And this is only in 2D, right? So these are the results in 2D. Then in 3D, we have uh, very similar uh, circumstances. We have on the left the um, development of the Kevin Helmholtz instabilities, but now we can see it in the third direction. And these are basically the same as before, but only showing up uh, three different uh, values of temperature. These are the isosurface of them, uh, 12, 30, and 40 uh, centigrade, right? Um, in different time steps. Uh, and you see the instabilities moving there. So we're going to see a movie of that. But what is important here is that this uh, transient happens in a more smooth way, but uh, and, it, and it definitely uh, stays there on, on the value that it needs to be uh, around 1.4 of the mean uh, of the whole thing. Uh, that's 1.4 percent error. But if we take it after the transient, the best result I've gotten so far are these, and these are basically 0.27% of the error. In um, admittedly a little bit of a bumpy ride, but the mean of the whole thing is what is actually measured. So that mean takes uh, this value at the end, right? So that's uh, the validation of the log exchange in 3D. Uh, in 2D, so we see that the model is working properly in those specific cases. And that's uh, saying that the, yeah, that the model non hydrostatic components and basically all of the energy and um, magnitudes are working together as, as expected. 
And these are results that I just got today. So these are preliminary, but uh, they show the uh, energy conservation inside the model. And this is the, yeah, I did it today. This is the first time we're, we're seeing this. These are the results from the validation paper. And it's not exactly the same. This go up the, all the way to 200 seconds. So this is sloshing back and forth. And that's why these two alternate between them, right? And we here, we have, in the right, we have up to 50 seconds actually. So this 100 is the number of outputs I did, but this is actually 50 seconds of uh, records. And you can see the, uh, the energy conservation is very similar, but it's actually a little better, a little improved in our implementation, right? So if you compare the two, I intend to do this for the whole 200 seconds, but so far this is what I have and we have also improved the energy conservation. Great, so let's see a little movie of these two. So what we're going to see is on the top, the isosurface for 12 and 14 degrees uh, over time, and on the bottom, the side view of how the tank looks uh, over time too, at the same time both. And we're going to see that Kevin Helmholtz instability is happening. And this is in 3D. Both of them are in 3D. So let's loop. Let's go. Right. So there you see there's definitely the swirling happening around. There's definitely the mixing happening. Uh, uh, you can see that as uh, the two layers are moving through each other. Uh, and in the bottom, you can definitely see those Kevin Helmholtz instabilities mixing with each other, right? So that's exactly what we want to see. That's a, a very encouraging result. It's definitely not perfect. There's ways to improve it, but I would say this is this is very, very good, okay? Uh, and the other thing is that this is wrong with the TL 0 0.1 instead of 0 0.0005. So this is running way, way, way faster, even in the, in the MATLAB than the other model does uh, in Fortran. Okay, good. That's uh, one result. And then let's see the 3D curvilinear grid that we did for the CMON. So we wanted to see how the CMON works in a full 3D curvilinear setting. And this is what I came up with. So first is it's not exactly the same as the Abuli paper because I moved this bump to the left so I can see more of what's happening behind it. And um, this is much more curvilinear than what Abuli did in his, in his uh, grid, right? So yeah, I don't have that figure here, but this is uh, much more abrupt of uh, change in the alignment of all of these grid lines, okay? So this is a side view of it, and this is a, um, another side view of it, but from the front, right? So this is the, this is the side where the um, forcing is happening. So this is this side. So this is the view from this side, right? So front view, side view. Uh, and this is only, the other, all of the, the other difference is that this is only seven point on, on that depth because otherwise it would take way, way too long. But uh, is higher resolution in horizontal and vertical, which are the two that we care about uh, than the Abuli one. But um, in any case, this is the grid that we came up with, and let's see how that works in actual solution, right? So as you can see, there's definitely transport happening. There's definitely a forcing mo moving on from left to right. And there's definitely, um, yeah, velocity mixing, transport, different uh, degrees of uh, velocity happening, right? So there's also necessary to point out, there's also some artifacts here. Uh, there's, I mean, that probably has to do with the implementation we have currently on, which is not the best one, and we have to improve that. But there's some hard artifacts happening around here. And the difference between top and bottom is just that in the bottom, I wanted to showcase that we actually are in 
a curvilinear setting. And as just to showcase how much these grid lines uh, bend and turn, and we don't see any of that uh, translated into the into the solution, right? Yeah, and these results are very, very similar to what Abuli shows in his uh, paper. It's just that there's no way to quantitatively, uh, qualitatively assess if this is uh, having a, the same result or not. Uh, this is just a proof of concept of showing up that the stuff is doing what it's supposed to do, right? Okay. Well, thank you. That's my presentation for today. Thanks, that was really cool. Thank you. Is there any questions? Do you have a guess of why you got those artifacts there? Yeah, uh, like we specifically a... those first two, like in front of the, the mm -hmm. mount, you know, that we, show up? The... We have a very good guess. Uh, something that I forgot to mention, this DT is DT five seconds, and this is uh -huh. 0 0.1 seconds. But that's not the, I don't think that's the cause of the, of these uh, artifacts. Uh, it probably has to do with the formulation we have for the model. So we found out that, we need to do more work in order to make it completely curvilinear everything. So this is curvilinear for the Laplacian, for the Poissonian problem, but the advection is not, and, and the temperature too, because that one is done with metrics the old way, uh, but the advection is not handled in a curvilinear manner. But that's, that's more technical, and that's uh, the next thing we need to solve right now. Right. Yeah, thank you. Cool. <clears throat> How did the, the uh, mimetic upwind scheme come about? Uh, no, the why it's here, but uh, how did you uh, get to where it uh, is now? Yeah, we, at some point we, des we detected that the model wasn't working and just in 2D with, a, with the log release, it had some high frequencies happening and we didn't have, I mean, any reason why it would do that. We were doing everything in, in mimetic operators and yeah, just going back to the literature and looking at the Kawamura, what it has to do, then I, came with the idea of may, maybe we need to do this on a one-sided manner because the advection scheme, the advection equation needs uh, this specific kind of information handled. And yeah, one thing led to the other. So then I asked Johnny to do specific operators to do one-sided gradient and uh, he came up with them and then I applied them and they work for the log release and and then I, well, I had to formulate the whole mathematics of it, right, of course. Uh, and the, the compact win, but also the uh, interpolation schemes and everything together. Yeah, it worked, but uh, there's, much work, there's more work to be done to actually port it to 3D curvilinear because those operators are not curvilinear. <laughs> Does anybody else have any more questions? Professor Castillo says it's a uh, Abu Ali. So I have to pronounce it Abu Ali. I'm sorry. I mispronounced it. Abu Ali. Abu Ali. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm rusty on, on my Arab. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everyone uh, for coming. Uh, thank you, Manuel. Mm -hmm. That was a great talk. Thanks very much. Okay. All right. Everybody have a great weekend. Everybody, thank you. And nice job, Manuel. Thank you.